Hello and welcome to Rehab Reels, Conversations on Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, hosted by Dr. Gwen Soa. My name is Andy Ziegler with the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. I'd like to welcome everyone joining us today for a special presentation on rehabilitation and medical complexity during COVID-19 with Dr. Debbie Tan. You may submit questions for our presenters through the Q&A feature on your screen. We will do our best to get to as many questions as possible during the allotted time. Our series host, Dr. Gwendolyn Soa, is the endowed professor and chair of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and is the director of the UPMC Rehabilitation Institute. She holds joint appointments in the departments of orthopedic surgery and bioengineering and has served as a clinician scientist in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation for over 15 years. Our featured guest is Dr. Debbie Tan. Dr. Tan is Medical Director and Section Chief of Rehabilitation Medicine at UPMC St. Margaret, an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh. She was born and raised in Manila, Philippines, where she studied physical therapy and medicine at the University of Santo Thomas Hospital, and she completed her PM&R residency and fellowship in spinal cord injury with the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle. Her clinical interests include neuro rehabilitation, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and stroke rehabilitation, and she has been overseeing the rehabilitation of COVID-19 and medically complex patients at UPMC St. Margaret. Dr. So and Dr. Tan, thank you so much for being with us today. Dr. So, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Andy, and thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, welcome back to Rehab Reels, if uh, you've been with us before. If not, welcome. And uh, today we have an extremely timely topic um, and one that we continue to all learn together about. Um, and as you heard, Dr. Tan is uh, joining us today um, to share with us what lessons she's learned along the way. There's no question, as you heard from her introduction, that she is skilled in neurorehabilitation, but certainly what happened this year has been exceptional. Uh, she, like others in our field, were thrust into care of an unknown disease uh, with unprecedented impact on our patients, their fam her families, and, and our society. Um, no question, her calm leadership and clinical excellence has allowed her to adapt to care for these exceptionally complex patients who present with new constellations of symptoms and challenges to their function, all while at the same time reinventing the way we provide care in, in terms of new safety measures and protocols. There's no textbook for this. Um, we're writing the textbook along the way. And so we've been so thankful to have her on our team um, and, and to provide the clinical excellence that she has provided and share with us today some of the lessons learned along the way as we continue to navigate this pandemic together. Dr. Tan. Thank you, everybody. I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, for allowing me to have the opportunity to share our experiences and what we've learned about um, treating patients with COVID-19 so far in our rehab unit. Um, COVID-19 um, obviously has affected all of us for the last year. And certainly as a healthcare provider, it has changed our ways and we were forced to quickly adapt and devise multiple strategies in order to provide efficient healthcare systems to our patients with COVID-19. Um, certainly, as Dr. Soa has said, you know, we are writing the textbook as we speak. Um, the information is still up and coming. It's very robust. We're just scratching the tip of the iceberg, basically, at this point. And what I may share with you as information and as facts might change over the next six to eight months up to a year from now as new studies and new information come about. I have no disclosures. These are the objectives of um, the talk for today. So in late December of 2019, a new highly pathogenic coronavirus emerged in Wuhan, China, and has since then caused a global pandemic. As of the last few days, um, the United States alone has reached almost uh, a, a little over two, uh, 25 million cases across the country and has claimed 
um, over 400,000 lives. In Pennsylvania, we have about 700,000 cases, uh, of which it claimed about more than 20,000 deaths. <clears throat> We have seen that over the holidays, there was an uptick in coronavirus uh, 19 cases uh, with increased hospitalization, especially after the Thanksgiving weekend. And what we have seen is that there is a, uh, a increase in the demographic um, of patients who are admitted to the hospital, primarily those who are above uh, 65 years in age. <clears throat> COVID-19, as we know, is a highly infectious uh, virus and it affects multiple systems in our body. Um, it favors the lung as um, it attaches to the alveolar linings of the lung tissue that causes uh, severe pneumonias. However, um, one thing to consider, is, uh, one thing to remember is that this is not the only organ system in the body that um, it affects. Um, it, because of the high inflammatory cascade or inflammatory response that it creates, it causes the nidus of um, formation of blood clots. So patients will have um, leg uh, venous thromboembolisms, high risk for lung embolisms or pulmonary embolisms, as well as myocardial ischemias or heart attacks. At the same time, uh, for the heart, um, it is uh, common to uh, observe that patients can have cardiomyopathies or and myocarditis, which is injury to the heart muscle itself. Um, in the brain, it does uh, affect uh, multiple systems um, in the nervous system as well. Um, it can cause and confusion encephalopathies, um, nerve injuries similar to Guillain-Barre syndrome, where it causes a lot of weakness. Um, patients can have uh, severe muscle weakness as a result. They can also manifest with stroke-like symptoms. Um, common symptoms that and with milder COVID-19 cases uh, include loss of um, smell, loss of the sense of uh, taste. Um, they can have diarrhea. They can have nausea, vomiting as well. And other um, organ systems can be affected and can cause increase in blood sugars. It can cause um, uh, rashes, uh, multiple types of rashes um, that can be diagnosed and delineated by um, skin biopsies. So Packard Carr um, looked at um, different uh, studies based in China uh, on a review article um, that came out recently that looked at um, comorbidities um, that can lead to patients having a more worse clinical course of COVID-19. And the leading comorbidities that were identified include hypertension, coronary artery disease, strokes, and diabetes. The illness patterns that we typically observe are the first two um, patients mostly that are asymptomatic. They test positive for COVID-19, but don't have any symptoms at all. Or those that have very mild symptoms, uh, low-grade fevers, they can have cough, sore throat, um, some loss of sense of taste and smell that can result in, that leads them to be isolated at home. Um, also, patients with symptoms that are much more worse than need to be admitted to the hospital. Um, later on, if the patients tend to have progress, um, progression in symptoms that become worse, that require intensive care unit admissions at that time, then those are the groups of patients that we are concerned about um, that will have a much more lingering effect in terms of um, having weakness or what we call long haul um, COVID-19 um, symptoms that require the assistance of the rehab medicine uh, team. So a lot of the data that I have um, to share in terms of post-ICU weakness, confusion, delirium, are derived from studies um, that are existent in patients who have acute respiratory distress syndromes. And as we know, um, COVID-19 can lead to 
severe pneumonias, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. One, um, one uh, condition that I would like to share is um, post -ICU, the concept of post-ICU syndrome. So it is a gamut of impairments um, that's described as new or worsening impairments in terms of their cognition, um, in terms of their physical strength or physical status, as well as mental status that come about after a critical illness um, that can persist um, after discharge from an acute setting. And these symptoms can last between months up to years. So the post-ICU care syndrome um, is um, further delineated into mental health issues such as anxiety and depression, cognitive impairments, um, executive function loss, uh, similar to difficulty with processing of information, organizing information, um, concentration, short-term and long-term memory, um, the ability to process information quickly, which later translates to, uh, it, can the patient pay their bills? Can the patient manage their own medications? Are they able to go back, go back to work? So it has these um, practical applications. Lastly, um, physical impairments that would include um, fatigue, um, um, muscle strength uh, limitations um, that we need um, rehabilitation for. I just wanted to um, discuss further each category uh, with you. Um, in intensive care, we know that patients typically are recumbent or laying in bed for a long time. And with this, we know from exercise physiology data that the longer you lay in bed, the weaker you become. We lose at least about 5% of muscle mass each day that we are recumbent. And um, that doesn't help. It makes the patients weaker. And if they're at baseline, um, are not physically active, then the tendency for them to have a very quick decline in terms of their strength and muscle function is much more prominent. Um, the use of steroids certainly does not help. Um, steroids are utilized in uh, patients who have severe sepsis or shock. Um, steroids also in COVID-19 has been utilized um, to try to reverse or shorten the duration of severity of infection as well as the use of paralytic agents um, for patients who require intubation or um, respirator use um, tend to require the use of paralytic agents, which can lead to muscle weakness. Two concepts that I want to share is um, critical illness, um, polyneuropathy and critical illness uh, myopathy. Sorry, critical illness polyneuropathy is a condition where um, the patients will have sign significant impairments in their nerves affecting the motor nerves, meaning the nerves that control movement and also the nerves that control sensation. In contrast, critical illness myopathy is a condition where you will have severe weakness of the muscles itself. To further distinguish them clinically, you will be, you need to, oops, I'm sorry. The way to distinguish it is that critical illness poly, uh, polyneuropathy tends to have more weakness distally, meaning the forearms, the hands, the distal leg, and the feet, compared to critical illness myopathy, where you can have more proximal weakness, meaning the shoulder, girdle muscles, the pelvic muscles, core muscles are much more weaker. Prognostically though, um, critical illness myopathy has a better chance for a quicker recovery. Um, and uh, to further test them, um, we do certain uh, evaluations such as electrodiagnostic studies or muscle and nerve biopsies. Other effects of immobility would include deconditioning, Patients will be very fatigued and have short of breath, um, even with a mere fact of just 
sitting up from their beds or sitting at the edge of their beds or even walking for a short distance in their rooms. Um, another um, result of immobility is postural instability, which means in, you can have blood pressure drops or what we call orthostatic hypotension as a result of um, being in bed for a long time. Um, muscle shortening as well as uh, soft tissue contractures are also um, uh, fairly common and we use uh, different techniques such as stretching, um, bracing to prevent these from happening. And lastly, uh, one key thing to remember is that if you leave a patient laying in bed for a long time, they are at a higher risk of having pressure sores or wounds around their backside, around their hips, their ankles, um, their neck, uh, their occiput or the back of their heads. Those that are in contact with, bone, uh, with bony prominences that can put a lot of pressure when you don't turn or re reposition your patients from time to time. Now, I want to talk about um, the concept of proning. You probably have seen patients or have heard patients being proned. So this is just a diagram of a patient that has been proned. So why do we do this? Um, critical care uh, societies uh, over the world have been recommending proning uh, for patients with severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is to improve gas exchange in all the lung tissue to improve um, ventilation or oxygen exchange. And this in relation has resulted in improvement in overall uh, decline in uh, mortality rates. Um, one big study um, that came out of the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013 um, the PROCEVA study that came out of France um, looked at um, about 466 patients who um, were grouped into two groups. One, those that were left in bed, just supine, laying down flat. And another group that had to be prone for about 16 hours a day. And what they found is a significant decrease in uh, mortality of about at least 50%. And we know that now with the advent of um, COVID-19 uh, related pneumonias and ARDS, there is now an ongoing clinical trial that's actively recruiting patients, looking at uh, the data of um, patients who are prone for 16 hours versus 24 hours. So the data will certainly come out um, pretty soon. Um, they're recruiting patients at least until um, 2022. Um, obviously, proning does not come without any side effects. So as you can see um, in this diagram, you know, nerves that are superficial, that are close to bony prominences, the common peroneal nerve or the fibular nerve, the ulnar nerves, um, can easily um, have um, compression and can have compression injuries. More so in more profound injuries, patients can have um, brachial plexus injuries as a result or sciatic nerve injuries. You can also have shoulder pain as a result of shoulder dislocations or subluxations. And if you can imagine if they're prone for 16 hours a day, you can uh, have some shortening of different um, muscles um, as a result and can lead to contractures. So Malik in 2020, just in September, they came uh, out with a paper that reported or described um, 12 cases uh, amongst um, 83 patients that were admitted in uh, Chicago in a rehab hospital between April to June of 2020, who were diagnosed with um, peripheral nerve injuries after being prone for ARDS in relation to COVID-19. 92 patients were prone and the injuries were correlated with edema or swelling resulting in compression of the nerves. The majority of the nerves occur in the upper arms and in worse extents, it involved the brachial plexus, which is the network of nerves coming out of the neck, going down 
uh, to um, innervate all the muscles of the upper arm. Um, we actually had two cases in our UPMC system that came across us who had um, brachial plexus injuries as a result of proning due to COVID-19 related um, respiratory distress. And our residents actually wrote up a paper um, describing those um, clinical cases. So the second category um, that I wanted to share is and discuss is the, um, the issues of delirium related to prolonged ICU stays. We have found that um, up to 80% of patients in the ICUs do have um, some form of delirium and confusion. And patients who are generally older, um, who have multiple comorbidities such as strokes, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, tend to have much more worse outcomes. And cognitive impairments, although they are present in majority of the patients at the time of discharge from the intensive care unit, tend to get better over time, although about 20% still have about, ling uh, about some lingering symptoms at a, uh, in five years. So how do we uh, prevent pre uh, delirium? Um, the Society of um, Critical Care Medicine uh, devised this A, B, C, D, E, F um, concept. So we A meaning assessing for pain, preventing pain. How do we manage pain? We use different strategies if possible, um, avoiding narcotics, um, which can uh, further worsen delirium. B, um, both spontaneous awakening and breathing trials. So patients who are on a ventilator, typically what they do is something called sedation vacation, basically turning off the sedating medications that the patient has to see and assess if the patient is alert enough, if they can follow commands and be able to participate in a ventilator weaning um, strategy or program at that point. C is the choice of sedation. You want a sedative that is fast acting, but also um, is metabolized quickly, that it wears off quickly. So one um, sedative that they typically use is propofol. Unfortunately, it fell out of favor um, or had a bad connotation because of misuse of certain individuals. Um, D meaning uh, is delirium monitoring and management. So we use different strategies um, such as improving the circadian rhythm, making sure that the patient has a semblance of night and day by opening up the curtains or pulling up the blinds uh, when it's daytime and then turning down the lights when it's nighttime to um, simulate that sleep-wake cycle. At the same time, reorienting the patient of what day it is, what year it is, um, to let them know what is going on and um, provide feedback uh, to the patients as well. Obviously, there are some medications that we can utilize to help with delirium and agitation as well. The fourth category is early mobilization and exercise. Um, I will um, expound on this concept later on, but this is where the rehab team can provide the biggest impact for our patients. As we know, early mobilization strategies have decreased uh, overall ICU stays and has decreased. Lastly, family engagement and empowerment. Patients, um, when we had families um, being able to visit, although it may vary from institution to institution right now, as a result of COVID-19, um, we have limited ability to engage with families, but we used to, in the older times, um, be able to start the conversation with the families about introduce what rehab is, um, and be able to teach them certain tools, say the simple fact of doing what we call range of motion exercises, moving their limbs to prevent contractures or joint tightness. These can be taught to the family. So while they're sitting there talking to the families and teaching the families how to do these things to help their loved one reposition, um, teaching them strategies to help redirect the patients when they're confused or agitated as well. 
And this creates um, a very good um, relationship between the rehab team and um, the family in general and the patient. So mental health also suffers as a result of being in the ICU for a long time. It was noted that you can have depression, post-traumatic stress disorders, as well as uh, anxiety affecting survivors up to about a year. Um, and it is noted that with pandemics, it is associated with a high level of emotional distress. This was described um, during the SARS pandemic um, in, the, uh, in 2010 uh, that came about in Hong Kong, but also true that what we are observing now in patients with COVID-19. So the level of isolation, social interactions that are limited due to um, separation from families has been very challenging. And part of it is, you know, we are trying to limit um, um, exposure to families, to patients, but also, you know, the healthcare system being overwhelmed and overburdened in the sense that our staff are stretched thin because of the sheer amount of patients that are in the hospital, that the case contact, the limit of contact between the healthcare provider and the patients are pared down to the bare essentials. And you know, there's no rapport that is being established between the care provider and the patients already. So rehab as a, as a role um, is, a, you know, the role of rehab is a patient-centered approach um, to address all the impairments of our patients um, as a result of um, the COVID-19 um, uh, impairments. And the hope is that this patient-centered strategy to, with the help of the allied medical professionals, including the therapists, the physicians, the nurses, um, the neuropsychologists, and everybody on the team, especially and including the family and the support system of the patient, we will be able to help the patient be much more independent and be able to maximize their opportunities and be able to reintegrate hopefully in society in a meaningful way and regardless of their new functional baseline. I actually had a patient who had um, significant weakness in his arm, but lo and behold, several months later after leaving home, he sent us a postcard that he started driving his Camaro, which is a little concerning at first, but we went with it. <laughs> We were happy that he was able to go back to have some semblance of normal um, after leaving the hospital. So I want to walk you through the process of rehab, how rehab starts. So we do start in the hospital, in the acute care setting, in the ICU or in the step-down unit, followed by transition to a rehab, a more dedicated rehab program um, with inpatient rehab or skilled rehab. And once they're ready to transition home, we order home care or home health care uh, to provide rehab inside their homes or um, directly to outpatient or a graduated in a graduated fashion, they start from home and then translate to outpatient therapies. Um, one key thing that I wanted to share is the rehab process at St. Margaret's and how we have shifted, uh, we had a paradigm shift pretty much after we learned new information on how to treat patients with COVID-19. Um, we start with acute care rehab, same thing with a step-down unit. And then once they're identified as rehab patients, we then um, plan to bring the patients to the inpatient rehab unit. In the summer, we knew months, months before that we thought that we have to do what we call a test-based strategy where patients need to have two negative COVID tests before they can come to the inpatient rehab unit. Now, the problem with that is 
some patients keep on testing positive, even 10, 20 days out. And that has created a big backlog of patients who are in the hospital because they cannot move to the next level of care. Um, hence, um, to assist the patients at St. Margaret's, what we did is we had um, a COVID rehab unit or a dedicated COVID floor where we took care of patients with active COVID symptoms. I will talk about that um, more in the upcoming slides. So in the acute care setting, like I said, you know, in the ICU, we start rehabilitation, we walk with the patients, we sit the patients up. Patients with intubation, who are intubated, who have a trach, these are not contraindications at all in terms of walking or mobilizing the patients. Usually we arrange for um, the therapy time to be scheduled around their what we call sedation breaks or sedation vacation that I talked about earlier. And we walk, we arrange and um, correlate these times with the respiratory therapist, with the nurse, and they mobilize the patients together with our therapists. Um, we teach the fa families, like I said, um, range of motion, positioning techniques to prevent uh, further um, decline in function. And we know from um, ICU literature that um, early active mobilization um, is associated with you know, decreased length of stay, improvement in uh, outcomes post-hospitalization. And this is a slide that pretty much um, outlines all the benefits of um, early mobilization in the ICU. So duration of being on the ventilation is less. Um, cost is definitely less. There is a shorter length of stay and you know, effects such as delirium sedation is also significantly lower. So as I've said earlier, the challenge of having a dedicated um, COVID-19 inpatient rehab unit is still um, based on how we treated our patients back in the summer is based on the advice of information from the CDC, from our own hospital administration's infection control team, as well as with the Wolf Center. Um, at that time, when patients are still testing positive for COVID-19, this is way back in the summer, um, we had to treat these patients only in their rooms. And that obviously will translate to limited abilities to do uh, treatments for these patients. Imagine you being confined into a small room and needing to learn how to walk how to get dressed, how to move about up and about. You are, we have been having challenges in terms of improving um, cardiopulmonary status, their endurance, because we are confined in the, the room itself. We had a dedicated team of um, therapists that have been working with them um, who have the proper PPEs and have been treating all these patients. There is no commingling of staff. They're not allowed to go down to the gym or into the common spaces. So they're basically locked in their rooms, which has made our therapists much more creative in terms of providing a therapy plan for those patients at that time. And this is a perfect example where there is a paradigm shift in terms of how we provided care for patients with COVID-19. Um, a few months later, um, we now know that even if a patient tests positive um, several days or several weeks after um, their initial infection, it doesn't mean that they're infectious at that point. Um, as of now, we moved from a test-based strategy to a symptom-based strategy um, to treat these patients. So patients now, um, as long as they don't have any symptoms, we keep them in isolation in the hospital for about 10 days. Then once that's clear and they don't have any symptoms uh, or medical issues and was deemed by the infection control team that the patient is COVID-19 recovered, we then transition them to the inpatient rehab unit. And at that point, we still observe the 
guidelines as recommended by the CDC um, and the hospital and the infection control team, you know, wearing a mask, uh, social distancing, um, limiting the number of patients in the gym, in the hallways, whenever we do therapies. And equipment is wiped down and cleaned thoroughly after each patient's use. At this point, family training can occur. So common issues that we try to manage in uh, an inpatient rehab unit. So some patients who still have respiratory symptoms, uh, who have a tracheostomy, um, we work with the um, pulmonologist to have a plan whether the patient can be decannulated. Some of these patients, like I said, will have severe pneumonias to the point that they will still have respiratory issues, their ability to cough, is impaired. Mm -hmm. Their ability to um, breathe on their own sometimes is impaired. Um, they might need oxygen supplementation or medications to help them breathe better. Um, they are commonly they commonly can have swallowing dysfunction as well. And uh, with the help of uh, the speech and language pathologist, we provide strategies on how to make them be able to sustain their nutrition at the same time, provide them with a way to swallow safely. So cutting up their food, or do they need a more thickened liquid before they start drinking thin liquids or water-based consistencies? Um, Next, would, we would address agitation, orthostatic hypotension, or drops in blood pressure by giving medications to help boost their blood pressure up. Um, we use non-pharmacologic strategies such as putting on um, stockings or what we call TED stockings to help uh, compress um, some of the nerves and blood flow. In the legs, we put an abdominal binder to increase intra-abdominal pressure to prevent significant blood pressure drops as well. One thing that I've noticed in our patients who came uh, to rehab after a prolonged uh, hospital stay in the ICU, they have a lot of sleep disorders. And, you know, when you're in the ICU, you have all the machines beeping all, all the time, and that can really disrupt sleep. Um, so we have utilized certain medications to help with sleep. Um, melatonin is very common. Some other medications we utilize, um, we pick depending on what the patient's needs are. Do they need a medication both for sleep and pain or sleep and you know um, stimulating their appetites um, or to quell their anxiety? So we try to judiciously manage them with uh, as little medications as possible or medications that can have multiple effects or benefits for our patients. Obviously, wound management is one of the things that we, uh, that is in our practice realm, as well as prescribing certain um, braces to help with joint contractures. Then comes discharge. Once the patient is um, ready to go home, we looked at uh, patients, mm. what they have in terms of um, symptoms, uh, persistent symptoms post COVID-19. Most commonly, they can have symptoms of fatigue, dyspnea, and joint pains even up to two months after being in the hospital. Um, Self-reported symptoms, I credit this slide to Dr. Gutierrez um, from UT, um, University of Texas in Houston, San Antonio. Um, who gave a very great lecture on uh, neuromuscular complications after COVID-19 at the AAP in our meeting recently. This is a collection of data of self-reported symptoms from a group of patients who formed a Facebook group, I guess, that had um, long haul COVID-19 symptoms. And we, they were able to identify that, you know, fatigue is very common. You can still have muscle aches and pains, um, weakness, anxiety, memory, and cognitive impairments as well. So one thing we try to prescribe for our patients um, who have left the hospital and transitioned home is to try to maintain some semblance of physical activity to be able to prevent uh, the decline or the gains that they had in an inpatient rehab unit. Um, so the uh, common 
uh, recommendation is to try to engage in some form of low intensity exercise, which can vary from, you know, walking, um, brisk walking, use of a stationary bike, um, yoga, um, lightweight training, as well as swimming. Um, in China, it has reported that patients go back to uh, qigong or um, doing uh, tai chi. Um, and this will improve balance at the same time, you know, improve muscle tone, um, as well as some form of weight training where patients are advised to only increase resistance by five to 10% at a time. And if a patient is uh, very fatigued or has low um, energy levels, uh, we can always advise them to um, try to space out um, intervals of exercise or provide um, some form of rest period in between exercise activities, um, as long as they're consistently able to do some form of exercise, it will be very helpful. So because of the advent of the long-term or long-haul post-COVID symptoms, uh, Comes, uh, came the advent of um, the concept of, of post-COVID-19 in the veterinary clinic. This is a clinic hopefully um, done in collaboration with a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, and a PMNR specialist or a neurologist as well to address multiple issues um, that can come about as a result of COVID-19. And... Um, there are some institutions already in the country that have begun um, such initiatives um, to service or provide care for patients uh, who are COVID-19 survivors. I know in UPMC that there has been, or there is a similar initiative um, in the pipeline to have uh, a similar clinic to provide uh, similar care. So I again credit Dr. Gutierrez uh, from UT Houston that provided um, some rehab-related um, COVID-19 diagnoses um, that where we can have most impact in care. Some of them is addressing pain, addressing um, motor weakness. Um, if they have cognitive impairments, um, you know, we try to treat them together with the speech and language pathologist, as well as in conjunction with um, the neuropsychologist who can provide more um, stringent testing um, to provide uh, information for the patient in terms of return to work or return to schools and uh, provide certain strategy strategies that can help alleviate um, those impairments. Lastly, um, some of the lessons we learned from um, taking care of COVID-19 patients. Collaborative care is the key to a successful team. Um, certainly in our institution, um, I, I witnessed firsthand how wonderful um, a collaboration of providers um, would be able to result in uh, very good patient care strategies, um, engaging your um, hospitalists, engaging the hospital administration, the nursing leadership, therapy leadership, um, and um, just being able to integrate and make sure that um, we are providing consistent care with the standard of care available for these patients. Um, we also was, uh, were able to witness firsthand how to quickly improvise um, treatment plans when we had a recent um, COVID-19 outbreak in our unit. And the hospital was unable to absorb all the patients who uh, tested positive for COVID-19. In a matter of a few hours, we were able to restructure the rehab unit to provide care for those patients that have COVID-19, that, that tested positive for COVID-19. Um, and we just took care of them. Um, we only transferred off patients who require 
an escalation of care, including respiratory support. But those who have very mild symptoms, we took care of them here until they were able to discharge home safely. We tried to do, we did that as well as we took care of those patients who may have been exposed but do not have any positive symptoms or did not test positive for COVID-19. And it took um, a lot of effort and um, really strong collaboration from all the uh, care disciplines in the hospital to make this successful. Um, in doing so, because this is a very new to a lot of our, our staff, you know, staff are scared, but um, providing them with the proper education, support, information on how to keep themselves safe so that when they go home to their families, they are safe, um, that they're not going to spread um, COVID-19 to their loved ones is very important. And providing an environment where we made sure that the staff felt heard that there, we provide emotional and psychological support um, in a very stressful environment was very important during that time. And in terms of innovation, one thing that came about is the use of telemedicine. Um, telemedicine has been available, but has been underutilized for many years, mm -hmm. um, certainly in not much utilized in our specialty. Um, I think the dermatologists use it a lot. Um, the uh, providers at the VA hospitals use it a lot to, for patients who have limited access to care. But now because of the need to conserve um, PPEs, the need to limit um, patient exposure so that the patients can feel safe, but still get um, quality care, the use of telemedicine has been much more robust. And lastly, um, engaging the families um, for training to get their buy-in, to start training and anticipate what they will need to expect or what they need to deal with in terms of discharge, in terms of going home. How are they going to take care of their loved ones? That is going to be very important in terms of transitioning the patient from a hospital-based setting in the rehab unit to um, successfully reintegrating back home. And that's all I have for you. Wonderful, Dr. Tan. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and all the lessons learned through this, this whole process. And, and again, we so much appreciate your, your calm leadership uh, through such a tumultuous time. It is it's truly the equivalent of building the plane while you're flying it, um, as we all learn together <laughs> through this process. So while others are thinking of questions for Dr. Tan, maybe I can start uh, with one or two. And, and you, um, in your talk today, mentioned um, fatigue and shortness of breath and how commonly these symptoms uh, linger on for some period of time. And I wonder if you could comment about what types of exercise, you talked about some of the exercises after patients go home that you've been advising, but what have you seen to be safe and, and well tolerated, just getting people back into things? And, and how do you monitor that to make sure that they're exercising and getting their conditioning back while, while still staying safe on, on the rehab unit? So the key thing is in engaging their families because their families are the biggest cheerleaders. And I guess they kind of tell on their loved ones too. <laughs> Whenever you see them in clinic, like, did you do this? Did you do that? It's the families that will tell you the truth. But um, honestly, you know, in terms of um, providing exercise, you know, we try to um, give them, once a patient with COVID-19 goes home, we give them kits um, to measure their oxygen levels, actually, and um, evaluate whether they need for continuous oxygenation and um, if they need support for that. So in conjunction with the pulmonologist, typically we look at how much oxygen do you need um, while you're walking? Do you still need this? Can we slowly cut back on the oxygen levels? And that's how we wean off um, oxygen too and monitor their symptoms. Um, mostly it's more self-reported symptoms. How much, how far are you walking? What's the distance now? And kind of like look at gradual progression. Like maybe I walk 500 feet to about a mile to, uh, you know, two miles. 
And these patients, you, you know, they are very proud of their achievements. Um, you will hear them come back and say, yeah, this is what I did like last time. I can, I cannot barely sit up in bed, you know, when I first came to you. So these are very um, credible um, um, responses as far as like, or measures of how we, they're progressing. Right, right, absolutely. And, and what a wonderful resource to have that home monitoring system in place so that patients can feel reassured that what they're doing is, is safe and have that feedback. So another great extension of, of telemedicine capabilities, basically, mm-hmm. right, having, okay. that, having that extension. Um, can, you, can you comment about when you think patients need formal pulmonary rehab? And for those that are following along that aren't familiar with that, it's essentially a formal outpatient process, retraining the lungs, just like we retrain the rest of the body. How, how do you make that decision? So uh, for me, it's if the patient has um, persistent, significant respiratory sim- issues, or if at baseline they do have underlying lung disease, such as um, COPD, or they do have an underlying uh, cancer, uh, lung-related cancer, or they have emphysema or asthma, those that have severe lung issues to start with, patients with sarcoidosis or any type of uh, connective tissue disease that affects the lungs that we know at baseline, they are uh, functioning at a much lower level. Mm -hmm. Um, And the need for them to progress gradually in terms of having a much more dedicated program um, to uh, help them improve their lung function. That's my gauge. Plus the fact that if they have other cardiac comorbidities, usually those are the patients, you know, those that have heart, uh, heart failure or heart attacks or bypass surgeries, those are the typical candidates that usually like to uh, refer to either cardiac rehab or pulmonary rehab also, but these are some of the perfect uh, candidates for it as well. Yeah, thanks. And and there's a a question um, from the the chat about oxygen needs while on inpatient rehab. And certainly this is something we always monitor very closely Mm -hmm. when patients are on inpatient rehab, but I suspect you've probably seen cases where there's more oxygen oxygen needs while they're in rehab than you would otherwise see. And, and how have you managed that? And how have you seen that, as well as their shortness of breath, impact their ability to participate while they're in rehab? Mm-hmm. Well, certainly that is very important. One thing that we look at first is the criteria, how much oxygen do they need even at rest mm-hmm. before they even come to rehab? If they're consuming more than six liters at rest, then we are going to be very concerned as far as like having them come into the rehab unit because we know if they're sitting down and they're requiring a very high amount of oxygen, the oxygen demand will be higher. So we wait and we kind of say, maybe you're not yet ready for inpatient rehab at this point. Perhaps we have to optimize your lung function. And a lot of times, Respiratory training is key, like improving their cough abilities, improving, you know, maximizing their medication sometimes, just scheduling certain medications, um, typically that we use for patients with COPD, like albuterol, um, ipratropium, to help open up the airway basically will help these patients get better. And usually after a few weeks, we are able to transition them to the inpatient rehab unit. And then at that point, usually, they are physiologically in a much better state uh, in terms of cardiopulmonary health and in their status that we actually are able to wean them off uh, oxygen or sometimes at least keep them at a very manageable level, not needing to escalate more than five or six liters at a time. Mm -hmm. Great. So maybe we could shift gears for a moment and talk a little bit about you touched on family-directed physical therapy and, and how impactful and helpful that can be, even with simple range of motion techniques and things like that. So there's a question um, from the audience about, would this be helpful in patients with, with sepsis or even while they're still experiencing delirium? Mm-hmm. I think it will be because um, part of it is, you know, the patient contact or family contact in itself and talking to the patients, even if they're delirious and doing all these repositioning exercises or moving them along will help stimulate their awareness of what's going on in their surroundings. 
Yeah, that's great. And, and, and analogous to what we do with some of our disordered consciousness patients, even right. that, that we know that has positive benefits. So that's great. Mm -hmm. um, another question, going back to your discussion about proning mm -hmm. um, and how this is kind of a unique experience. And we're now just starting to see some of the long term sequelae of that life-saving mm -hmm. technique um, in, in helping the patients in terms of their pulmonary compromise. So I wondered if you could talk about how you've been discussing these findings with your critical care colleagues who are referring you these patients and you know what kind of discussions you're having and what kind of recommendations we can make now that we are starting to see this to try to prevent some of those complications. I think I, I've talked to probably a couple of our colleagues here in the hospital saying, hey, have you seen this? Because even then, we're just learning about um, the effects of proning as a whole, um, that they're not even aware that this came about, that patients came back with very high, you know, very severe nerve injuries. So they said, oh, I haven't heard of that. So I think it was a very good opportunity for us to say, hey, we think that this is probably from how they were positioned for a long time. And we talked about maybe restructuring some of the ways that you prone the patient, making sure that some of the areas that are much more vulnerable for nerve injuries are padded so that they won't get those issues. Um, and certainly pressure injuries is very common. We know from the data from, you know, patients not even just with spinal cord injuries, but even just regular patients that don't have any problems with their sensation. If you stay in bed for a long time, they can have wounds. So making sure that they have the appropriate equipment to offload those areas while they're proning. Yeah, that's great. It really speaks to the importance of an interdisciplinary team and that communication. And as we all learn through this process, how important getting those teams and the, that networking, that communication is. So. Yeah, excellent. Um, there's a question about, about kidney transplant. And, and so the question is about research on co the COVID vaccine. Um, I, I will say what I'm aware of, and then like to hear Dr. Tan if, if you have um, some additional information on that. So to my knowledge, there's not any specific data that came from the trials just because of the sheer numbers um, in terms of determining safety for the vaccination for COVID for kidney transplant patients. But but certainly anyone taking immunosuppressive is at higher risk of contracting the illness and post-transplant patients are certainly at higher risk for, for more severe disease. So I, I wonder if you had any um, additional information on that specific topic. I think my knowledge is the same as what you have described. I would recommend that if they have kidney transplants and they're concerned about the COVID-19 vaccines is talking to their transplant team and going back to their physicians um, and discussing if there's any risk versus benefits about truly, you know, getting the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. excellent, excellent suggestion. Um, so with just a few minutes left, maybe I can end with one last question and that is asking you to get out your crystal ball on this, right? You talked about some of the some of the challenges that, that we're seeing in persistent symptoms and what people are now terming long haulers, people that have long-term symptoms much after the infection has abated and, and some of the symptoms have, have gone away, but still some persistent symptoms. Um, can you make a guess or surmise what you might think we expect to see long-term? Um, you know, certainly, for example, we as physiatrists have taken care of post-polio patients mm -hmm. our entire careers. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you expect to see in the post-COVID era when we get to that point in, in terms of long-term effects that you think we might be um, seeing and treating for the foreseeable future? I think for those with severe peripheral nerve injuries, tend to have more long-term impairments. Um, those patients who do have some reversible muscle weakness or myopathies, certainly the prognosis is much better. I would expect in six months to a year's time, they should be able to regain all of most of their function, but certainly those that have critical illness, polyneuropathies or nerve injuries that are very severe, those are the ones that we anticipate will have long-term issues down the road. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so, 
much more to come, much more research needed, much more clinical care needed. So, so thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your expertise um, and your experience with us today. It's, it's uh, very, very important, very timely, and, and we'll continue to learn together. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'll turn things back over to Andy to wrap up for us this afternoon. Dr. So and Dr. Tan, thank you so much uh, for an excellent presentation and discussion. Very much appreciated. For anyone who uh, had a question we were unable to get to, or if you would like to learn about ways to support the initiatives of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, uh, please contact me at raz37 at pitt.edu. Uh, Dr. So and Dr. Tan, thank you again. And everyone who joined us, please be on the lookout for future sessions of Rehab Reels. And I hope everyone has a good evening.